Met General Chairman of the International Muskie Symposium, held in La Crosse, Wisconsin, April 4 through 6, 1984. This symposium gathered the world's experts on the history and biology of the muscalinch. These experts performed research experiments over the last few years and presented them in verbal form at the symposium. Their full research papers will be available in book form in January of 1985 from the Symposium Committee or the American Fishery Society. These videotapes are presented as a part of the unique cooperative effort between sportsmen and the experts that was the theme of this symposium. They are not intended to be quality video productions, but informative sources for education of agency, sportsmen, and student resources. For information regarding the symposium or other videotapes, please contact this address. Enjoy your viewing. I can certainly agree with uh, the sentiment that was expressed here just a few minutes ago that we do have a good deal of uh, underutilized information, but uh, at the same, same time, I feel that uh, one of the problems we are dealing with in this case is that the information that we have on the biology and life history of this species is uh, rather uneven in terms of its quality and quantity. And one of the problems associated uh, with this, this particular species, is that the muscalunge is a rare species. I, I say rare in the sense that it usually exists in low population densities. Uh, the individual animals are solitary most of the time, and even though they can attain large size, they're quite secretive. Uh, the challenge is that uh, these that these characteristics presents to anglers are are obvious, but to the point of this summary, uh, it also greatly complicates efforts to obtain knowledge related to uh, the fish's biology and for needed needed to uh, manage the populations in, in nature. Now this symposium hasn't really been organized in a way to draw together all that is known about the fish, and I would suggest that this is uh, something that could be thought of for a future project. But I think that it has been useful in helping us to understand what type of work is presently uh, being done and in pointing to research needs in the area of just general biology, life history, and ecology. As I've listened through to papers throughout the symposium, uh, and just recently in the last slide that we've seen, one of the recurring themes is a concern for better information on aspects of reproduction, early life history. And I think it's at least comforting to learn that a number of researchers are dealing with this gap in our knowledge today. Uh, Gammon's contribution on sperm production and spawning success suggested that although male muscalunge may devote relatively less metabolic energy to sperm production than male northern pike, this doesn't necessarily detract from egg fertilization success. However, Gammon did find that the continued viability of the eggs may depend on potential egg uh, predators and the microenvironment of the egg deposition site, a fact that has been emphasized by Dombeck and some others as well. Uh, Complementing Gammon's report is a very nice poster paper. It's not part of uh, my session, but I want to mention it by LeBeau, Peugeot, and Crossman that described the female reproductive cycle and made the very thought-provoking suggestion that fecundity or egg production within local populations may be used as an element of a life history adaptive strategy to local environments. I think another thing that has come out of this session is a realization that biological research on muscalunge is going the route of high tech. 
as evidenced by four studies which employed biotelemetry to learn about the behavior of individual animals, make inferences about populations. Strand used the technique to identify spawning sites in Leech Lake, which he described to us in some detail. And I think based on his findings and uh, some other information we have, it might be reasonable to speculate that uh, some of the factors contributing to co-survival of muscalunge and pike in this particular lake is the existence of suitable uh, musky spawning habitat that's spatially isolated from the spawning and nursery areas of pike. Now, Schivoni and his associates also used telemetry to identify spawning areas in the Thousand Island region of the St. Lawrence River. Uh, descriptions of these areas, plus earlier information gathered by Gammon, Crossman, Dombeck, and others before them, he is beginning uh, to help us to assemble the spawning habitat puzzle. But I believe the work must continue in a variety of other environments before we can be satisfied with this knowledge. Uh, what type of habitat are these muskies using in these Kentucky streams? Uh, that paper on the Kentucky fish kind of blew me away. I thought I knew what muskellunge habitat was like before I heard that paper. Additionally, I think we have evidence that suitable nursery areas differ from spawning habitat and some features. The St. Lawrence River Project has given us some information on this, promises to provide more. But the description by Craig and Black of nursery habitat in Georgian Bay is certainly the most detailed effort of this kind to date. There, important factors defining the habitat equality appear to be aspects of water depth and the type and quantity of aquatic vegetation. This information was translated into useful guidelines for identifying, managing, and protecting the habitat. Other applications of telemetry were shown in several papers. Strand tracked adult muscalunge in Leech Lake through the seasons and found that there were distinct warm and cold season home ranges. And he also identified a number of habitat features that seemed to be associated with home range size and location. Schivoni also reported annual shifts in habitat use among St. Lawrence River fish, while Miller and Menzel reported warm season shifts in habitat use and movement behavior among adults in an Iowa lake. Uh, further, they noted that these behavioral patterns uh, seem to be associated with seasonal changes in water temperature, transparency, vegetation growth, and finally place this in the context of an optimum foraging strategy, suggesting that the fish change from active searching predators in the early season to sedentary ambush predators later. Uh, all of this new knowledge about seasonally changing behavior I think has obvious implications for the muscalunge angler and the manager alike. Finally, Gilbertson uh, demonstrated a very useful management application of telemetry by observing the winter movements of telemetered juveniles in uh, shallow, winter-kill-prone nursery lakes and their responses to the seasonally decreasing dissolved oxygen comp uh, concentrations. Uh, this knowledge was used to develop a more efficient winter rescue operation. Clearly, uh, biotelemetry offers great potential for expanding our basic biological knowledge of the species. Knowledge of the age and growth of fishes is one of the most basic and useful pieces of information to fishery managers. But as Castleman pointed out, the standard aging techniques based on scale measurement has shown to be error prone when applied to the long lived muscalunge. He and his associates therefore developed an aging technique uh, based on the clythrum bone, which has proven accurate for all ages and sizes of fish. With this method, he showed that uh, trophy muscalunge from Canadian waters tended to live to greater ages and sizes than those from U.S. waters. And he also showed that although the hybrid tiger muscalunge may enjoy good growth, growth rates up to about eight years of age, the maximum age and size is probably less than that of the muscalunge. You also indicated to us that uh, there's still the possibility of improving upon that uh, 
Maximum size fish, it's about uh, 69 pounds, 15 ounces. There's still hope, theoretically. In his paper concerning a form of cancer in Isasid, Sans de Garde reminded us that even well-managed Isasid populations can be devastated by disease. In the case of uh, lymphosarcoma at this time, we have little ability to control the problem once it starts in a population. But as Sans de Garde described, there is knowledge on the viral transmission of the disease and on the environmental factors that promote the transmission, and based on this, there are a number of uh, prophylactic management strategies that can be applied in areas where the disease occurs. But I think equally fascinating was his account of the valuable spin-offs of cancer research in general, that knowledge of the genetic factors associated with fish cancer has important implications for human cancer studies as well, and that advances in genetic technology offers promise for growth promotion in cultured animals, perhaps even muscalunge. Breeding of a superfish. I believe one of the most important conceptual advances in freshwater fisheries management in recent years is the recognition that genetically distinct stocks or population groups often exist within a given species. And moreover, that these stocks represent a biological adaptation to local environmental conditions. There are many implications of this general stock concept to muscalunge management and culture. And indeed, there has been taxonomic and other biological evidence that the stock concept applies to muscalunge. Recently, as uh, we've heard, biochemical techniques have been developed that are useful for distinguishing genetic characteristics of individual animals and populations or stocks to which they belong. Uh, the technique of electrophoresis, which separates different varieties of proteins, which are the direct products of the genes, um, are an application of this. The papers by Koppelman and Philip and by Philbach, Post, and Legrand represent the first effort to apply this technique to determination of genetic variation and stock identification in muscalunge. Koppelman and Philip surveyed both natural populations and hatchery stocks from the Midwest and the Northeast. They demonstrated that considerable genetic variability does indeed exist within the species and their evidence suggests that several genetic stocks may then uh, exist. Philbox fish samples were from Wisconsin and Minnesota lakes in a North Dakota hatchery population and was particularly directed towards resolving a question of whether there is a genetic basis for observed growth differences between populations. She found evidence that three uh, genetically distinct population groups, one of which was the slow-growing fish of Shupak in Mud Callahan Lakes, existed. And uh, she further extended her uh, research to a biochemical examination of the actual genetic material, DNA, that supported her general electrophoretic conclusions. Uh, clearly, this uh, effort at uh, identification of genetic stocks is a, a merely a beginning, but I think the uh, research that we've heard from uh, at this symposium suggests that uh, there is uh, much to be learned and that this is a, a very useful technique. Thank you. Others who assisted with the, uh, the program, if you can possibly stick around, please do so, and uh, we're going to have uh, <clears throat> some recognition uh, for those people following the summary. Sorry about that. We're winding down. I know you're all anxious to get to lunch, and as I divide five into 30 minutes, it doesn't leave room for the rest of us. Uh, too well if we take too much time, and I will beg the indulgence of the people in session two to help uh, try and make up a bit in this regard. 
Uh, the session addressed itself with interaction, community interactions and species interactions as they have long been defined and identified as a, a very major consequence. The uh, community or species interactions involved the muskellunge and the northern pike in several aspects, the muskellunge versus the walleye in one particular aspect, and the uh, number of uh, isosid species, including the muskellunge, the northern pike, and the hybrid, in regard to a different kind of interaction, their requirements in their juvenile periods as it applied to uh, kinds and abundance of food or prey species. Another situation reversed the process, and that our normal focus here is the problems associated with the abundance of the muscalunge, and in this case the, um, the paper addressed the problem of the muscalunge as an attempt to control population numbers of other kinds of species, the old idea of an isosid, a top-line predator, as a means of controlling so-called trash species, and secondarily of keeping a better control on certain kinds of other kinds of, of uh, sport fishes, which do have a tendency to run wild uh, without an, an adequate predator, and that address was uh, the concept of, of uh, introducing muscalunge uh, in conjunction with a walleye into an existing bass panfish um, environment to see what would happen. The last paper, in effect, also addressed the concept of muscalunge, um, uh, tiger muscalunge survival at the juvenile stage as it applies to prey species and um, the sizes and the kinds of times, or sorry, sizes of the, of the tiger muscalunge and the, t the uh, times at which one might put them in. Uh, Peter Inskip's very interesting and very useful overview of the whole problem of our attitude towards species interaction and community interactions, I think, properly put us in mind of the idea that we have long looked upon these in, in somewhat black and white uh, modes, and that we have a very large gray area in the middle that we must be careful of, and that we don't uh, dis decide that these things are cut and dried long before they, they really are. We need to do a lot more consideration about, yes, we consider these negative. Are they really negative? Is there evidence? And he did an extremely good job in that regard, and then led very nicely into the next one, in which Dombeck and his associates provided us at last with a kind of quick and ready tool which we drastically need in order to stop saying we'll keep looking, but to start with a prognosis, to start with a diagnostic tool which will allow us to look at the ecological factors, the geographically, geographical variabilities, and to start uh, anticipating the idea of prognosis and diagnosis, to look ahead and say, all right, we've got a limited amount of money, uh, we've got a limited amount of personnel, we've got a limited amount of cooperation from the anglers in regard to when we're going to get something positive. So let's identify the best places that we can hope for uh, a maximum of success by a minimum kind of input, because that's really what faces every one of us when we get around to choices between what we're going to do in research, is what can be best done with the amount of money that, has in, that we have in hand. And I think the contribution that Mike and his colleagues have made in this regard I think will, will yield real important uh, results in the future. All of the people, I think, addressed themselves very well to the, the problem of, uh, of interaction. You will see their papers in the published book, which all of you will be able to digest in, in, at your leisure and with the opportunity to see facts and figures to support the very philosopher general terms, which I'm summarizing the session. But one of the things I did was to try to uh, uh, write down some concepts of the research and management implications of the information that was presented in that particular section in just very quick and telegraphic form. The implications I noted are as follows. One, our understanding of the results of short-term and long-term interactions of various types is far from complete. There is better evidence for effects on individuals than there is for effects on population trends with time. The factors are complex. They're geographically variable. You should not count on 
information derived in one specific locality as being extrapolatable to broad segments and certainly not over the whole range of the muscolunge. We need precise information on species interactions and community interactions in specific locations. Mike and his group identified the fact that there was a severe interaction of, of pike and muscolunge in one uh, area but was in between two other areas in which the the situation was literally reversed or much less troublesome than it had been in the center one. We've now been provided with the tool which makes possible a prognosis for success of self-reproducing populations of muscolunge in various bodies of water, and that tool is derived from the analysis of morphoidaphic and community factors which are readily available and, and out there uh, easily uh, assimilated by us, and we should start using this sort of thing. Large bodies of suitable water providing heterogeneous habitats apparently provide the best chances for survival of muscolunge when they're interacting especially with northern pike. But pike are probably the worst single factor that has been identified within the threatening situation as far as muscolunge populations. If we have this egocentric a viewpoint, which we always do. We're managing stocks for man's own uh, best benefits, and in this audience, man's own best benefit has been established or set for our discussions as basically muscolunge oriented, and so that's particularly the case, that, that pike seem to be the biggest uh, problem, and yet we'll have to rationalize, we'll have to come to some medium standpoint in regard to interest as, as they concern pike as well. Riverine situations are sometimes better than lacustrine situations and possibly should be emphasized. And drainage lakes are better than seepage lakes. And here again, we have value judgments we can make when it comes to spending research time and money. Rising springtime regimes of water level are better as opposed to stable or declining regimes. And we should manage these and research the effects of these on what we want, better production of muscolunge. Introductions of new piscivorous predators into established populations of muscarange do not always have the serious adverse effects that we might have thought was the case previously. The effects are there, they are not universal, they are variable, and they must be carefully looked into, but introductions are not oh, per se the bugaboo that we might have assumed they were. At least in certain circumstances, introduced muscolunge cannot be considered as a solution to an existing population problems or overpopulation problems, particularly as it applies to spiny rayed fishes. In certain cases, uh, white suckers, they could reduce them. In certain other cases, with gizzard shad, they did well because of the abundance. But certainly, when it came to spiny rayed fishes, they were not the solution to a problem. Introduce larger young esaucets and at lower water temperatures in autumn. This is the byword that has come out of this. A sure availability of cover if it's possible, although certain situations the correlation between availability and survival was not uh, obvious. Uh, soft finned forage as candidates for costly and effort intensive introductions seem the best bet and certainly the concept of introducing or, or managing populations of spiny rayed fishes as a food for you know, muscolunge which you're attempting to establish would appear at this time to be rather uh, without um, real contribution. I think the group identified a number of things that could be worked on by all of us who have the opportunity to do so. And I think the group has in fact identified that we would like to hear from others who are the resource users and who after all are the major interacting population with the muscolunge. And that's the, the people in this audience, both as, as anglers or as frustrated anglers um, working for a DNR or other kind of agency. And we certainly still need input as to the opportunity to determine what we should do about the community interaction and what we need to do first and what we can leave till slightly later to try and accomplish a maximum input, a maximum benefit for a minimum of dollars and time spent. I'd like to thank the panel members for having done a, a very good job and, and uh, allowed us to see this uh, overall picture.
Thank you, Ed. Uh, we're next going to hear the uh, hear a brief summary on the session on management considerations, and uh, Chuck Johnson from Wisconsin will deliver that. Okay, thanks, Bob. He brought Leon Johnson out of retirement after 37 years to give his work summary in 20 minutes. And now you want me to summarize his 37 years work in, uh, what, five minutes? Or less. Or less. In one response to, uh, to Bob, I think we can spend your money at $25,000. I think there's a, I don't know if the gentleman's back there, Frank Pratt will figure out a way to spend it. Uh, I have to just elaborate on one thing is that, you know, laying $25,000 on the table, it sounds easy enough to say, we'll grab that, we'll run a career census, we'll uh, run a basic inventory, and but you got to set up some kind of a goal and objective. And thinking of Mike Dombeck's talk yesterday on the spawning marsh improvement type project, I couldn't help but take that $25,000 and tuck it into a spawning area. But there's certain things. State uh, employee or the state of Wisconsin cannot do capital improvements on private property. So I think, Bob, we'll let you keep that $25,000 you go over and see Frank Pratt, he'll set up a project, you pay for the, the project, work, write the EIA, and Frank will help you, water reg permits and so forth, and we'll, we'll take that $25,000 and run a good project. But anyway, getting to the summary of why I'm up here is, yesterday Jack Wingate started off our session with a detailed report on management philosophy. And trying to put this all together, I decided I'd just set a goal. Uh, management goal. And to throw it out is to maintain a, a native musquanch population at a self-sustaining level within their native range. From there, talk about some objectives. One objective would be to maintain a trophy fishery within that, that management goal. And that would be the opportunity to catch a 30-pounder or an opportunity to catch a 50-inch fish. Some of the other statistics would be say one legal fish per acre harvest annually, uh, one legal fish per every 80 hours of fishing, uh, maybe fishing pressure 50 hours per acre on that particular lake or within the range. Number two objective would be to maintain uh, the genetic strain. I think too often we hear about the Leech Lake muskie, it's got ability to spawn in six feet of water, uh, we've got musky spawning problems, say, up in uh, northern Wisconsin. The eggs at the interface of the bottom, there's no oxygen, according to Mike Dombeck's work. Uh, so right away, we're going to try and get another fish in there that'll go out a little bit deeper, get away from the, the organic silt buildup in the shallow bays that is having a high BOD. But maybe we should take a look at that spawning area, get in there, run around a little bit, clear out some of that organic debris and try and make that a healthy environment. That fish that's there has evolved, but now through an aging process, there's a limiting factor. So I think that we could, first of all, take a look at that limiting factor. Some of the strategies that we'd like to uh, develop as a result of our session would be regulations, size limits, bag limits, seasons, special regs, higher minimum size, and catch release. Promote catch release to, to maintain and reach our goal. Stocking would be another strategy. I think uh, Dave Hansen and uh, Mike Hoff indicated yesterday about uh, uh, fingerling research. Large fingerlings will generally su survive better than small fingerlings, and such stocking were the most effective way to propagate muskies. Small muscalange fingerlings approximately four inches can contribute to sport fishery when stocked in lakes with low density of predators and a, and a high or good supply of suitable forage. It's re recommended that only large size 12 inch larger fingerlings be stocked where there is a moderate to large northern pike uh, population. Some other strategies as far as reaching our goal Protection of the habitat uh, through state regulations, local zoning, uh, wetland codes, could be mining and, and forestry uh, uh, codes, restrictions is what's happening in the watershed. As mentioned earlier, uh, uh, abatement of uh, non-point uh, sources of pollution, acid rain, 
and so forth. I think uh, uh, Mike Dombeck uh, really hit it clear yesterday, uh, and I'm just going to use some of his words. Loss or alteration of habitat, especially reproductive habitat, is considered to be a major cause of the responsibility for the decline of the native muscalonge populations. And he recommended some proposed guidelines uh, to address this. Identify spawning areas and consider acquisition of lands adjacent to and influencing spawning areas. There's another good spot for your $25,000. Lands do not always have to be state-owned, but uh, organizations that have the dollars that could go in and acquire some of these uh, adjacent lands that will protect the spawning area, I couldn't think of a finer investment of the money. It's going to only continue to be more valuable. Uh, maintain dissolved auction levels, uh, concentrations, and, and we haven't done a lot of that as far as in, in the field management type work. We do a lot of uh, thermal chemistry type work looking at out in the middle of the lake and also through the ice. But I think this is a program that I think our managers are going to have to get into is looking at our lakes where we do have deficient and have documented lack of natural reproduction of the muskies. Take a look at, at the spawning areas. Uh, rehabilitate spawning substrates where bottom deals fall out. Uh, here again, dredging. I was thinking about some of the new sheeting, geotextile type equipment they used on, on access roads, parking lots, and so forth. Maybe a layer of that could be put down one of these mucky areas and a uh, fine, clean placement of sand or, as Mike indicated, some woody uh, particles or I don't know if it would be wood chips or you'd use uh, tag haulers or whatever the source may be. But it's a new, new idea, an innovative idea. Somebody's got to tell Mike about gasoline to put in that chainsaw. That one slide he had yesterday, that little crib he had, looked like he, he hacked on that for some time. The AstroTurf, uh, we've used it in the Great Lakes. It has good application. I think that's one thing it has been hit on the head here, innovative ideas. We all have ideas, but we've got to have administrators and, and uh, support from muskie fishermen, from the public, to try them. And I think we can go some places with them. Uh, Mike pointed out a lot of adjacent timber to lake shores to mature, fall in the water. Habitat. Uh, we all know people that own lakeshore property. We're involved in, in local organizations. We fish lakes. We're talking all day long in a boat. We see shorelines where it used to be uh, ribboned with, with sedges, bulrushes, and now people have removed them. There isn't, in Wisconsin anyway, a state law prohibiting people from ta taking and removing aquatic vegetation. As they can cut it and remove it from the lake. They can't leave it float around. They're in violation then. Any type of chemicals, they have to have a permit. But if you walk through these bulrushes and sedges, and I'm sure as the, the slides have been shown the last couple of days, it's obvious that this is prime habitat. And there's a message. You know, it isn't always spending $100,000, but it's spreading the word. Response to the high school teacher. Uh, the kids, they go home and they, they put the parents to the test. What do you think of this? And. Uh, Sure, uh, I guess uh, the father that goes out and, and uh, sets a standard out there, whether it's a good or bad, uh, the child is going to look up to him. But uh, when you're out fishing with uh, the youngster or hunting, and he comes up with uh, an idea that was fostered in school, uh, it may be an excellent one, and he may teach that, that older person. As Art mentioned, a lot of the people are losing their hair, but uh, I think we all have a lot to learn at any age. And I think the young person is a person that can be the tool to sell a lot of these ideas. Okay, uh, moving on off of uh, protection of the habitat and zoning, surveys. In our session, Leon Johnson brought out a, a new standard that can be used. Steve Searns brought one out on the walleye a, a few years ago. It's an equation that can be used by the field manager. You can make a false survey, either uh, set up index stations on the lake, or make one complete circuit of the lake and expand that and predict the fingerling production. It's, it's a real ace. Uh, manager goes to a meeting and somebody says, what's happening out there? And he can say, I spent one night on the lake or his technician was out. 
and uh, he run a survey, and, and this is what they found. People like to be kept up what's happening out there. I think the message on Iron Lake was well stated yesterday by Seiler when he said that if they could have kept on, after the introduction of muskies, if they could have kept on monitoring that, they could have predicted what had, would happen. And then it wouldn't have been coming from the public, they could have been the leader. And surveys are very important, and Leon's technique will be put to great use. Public involvement has been brought out here several times this morning, and, and uh, communications, it sounds so simple, but uh, what do they say, 90% of communications is nonverbal, and I think that we just have to try and work at it and do a better job. I think there's uh, uh, going to meetings and, and uh, rubbing shoulders, taking time to talk, and sometimes we just think our program is too important, we're just too busy, and we just don't do that. Improvements have to be made there. Okay, uh, as far as some of the other things that were brought out here the last couple days, uh, I'd like to follow up with problems. And it looks like overharvest and loss of habitat's been brought up. I think high exploitation of our young fish. Most of our Creole census uh, data would suggest that uh, fish are five, six years old and they're yanked out. Castleman indicated uh, in his equation model that fish could be 30 years old. Well, I, I, looking at the Northwest District, uh, just trying to recall, I think Leon Johnson had some fish up to 17 years of age in, in Coeur d'Alene. I, I don't know if Leon's here, if he could add to that. But it's there, and we have to allow these fish a greater opportunity to grow. Green Lake, uh, uh, the average size uh, was 70% of the fish were taken between under 33 inches, and the average 9.2 pounds. And they were four years old. If you could leave them in there for another, another couple of years, they could be up to 36, 38 inches, and probably weigh 14, 16 pounds. Well, the catch and release program that uh, uh, musky clubs are promoting is surely addressing the situation. Uh, strain management. Uh, I think this is one, as I mentioned earlier, we're jumped to look for something new, a new exotic all the time, and I think we should try and work, take a good hard look at what we have before we tackle, tackle something new. The other thing that's been brought out here is a lack of public support on this walleye musky uh, predation relationship. This really worries me. I sure wouldn't want it to come from this session that the muskie is, is controlling the walleye fishery out there. Sure, the muskie is the top of the food chain. He's going to eat a few walleyes. But we probably have 20 good baseline surveys in northern Wisconsin, and there's no evidence of this. These lakes all support good sucker populations, soft-rayed fish, and I'm sure the muskies are primarily feeding on these fish. But we have no evidence of that. In fact, our, usually if we are good walleye lakes also support a good muskie population. The word is coming out here. Okay, <laughs> knowledge is, we, we have a lot of knowledge uh, uh, collected and uh, growth, age and growth information, population data, studies on strains, spawning habitat, uh, uh, Crossman's uh, identification of, of fish species. And I think if he could work a little bit harder and tell us how we could just look at a muskie throughout the year and sex them, somehow just holding up looking at them. It's uh, in the spring, you can always do it. The female has a wor worried look on her face, and the male's got the smile. Uh, the needs, I think we have to uh, look into our hatchery program and, and look at that early life history study from fry to about two and a half inches. That's one problem we have in our hatchery program. I think there's more research needed. Uh, the other thing, we've got to ur urge the clubs, take a look at your tournaments. There's a, there's a feeling out there about when all the bass boats get on the, on the lakes. Uh, it's an impact. People are looking out, out on their docks, and, and here comes the musky fishermen. We've got to work, work to improve our image. Uh, innovative ideas. Work with your local resource people. Try and create some innovative ideas. Bob will spend that $25,000. I want to thank all the people in our session. They did a super job.
in response to something that's been said, I might just announce that the method for external sexing muscle is available. The fourth session, technical session, was on artificial propagation of muscalunge and certainly well, we've heard a number of uh, very impressive papers on uh, both the recreational aspect and the general ecological aspects of the animal. Artificially propagated muscalunge are and, and appear to in at least the near term re uh, remain a very important part of what muscalunge management is all about. The first speaker was John Klingbeil and John working from the Wisconsin experience gave a very comprehensive treatment of extensive culture and intensive culture of purebred muscalunge utilizing natural foods. The state of the art has reached a point where even though we're looking at intensive culture and looking for the breakthrough with artificial diet, John made a very clear case of the pros and cons of both extensive and intensive, but pointed out that with control, with considerations of the things that cause the variables in, in productivity, that extensive culture of purebred muscalunge has been and will continue to be very successful and it is reliable, it is consistent, and it will support a very fine sport fishing program. And uh, that is the case and until some breakthrough comes uh, with artificial diet. Uh, we shall remain with this state of the art and I believe it will be very successful as indicated by John's presentation. Following that, uh, one of the other speakers did address the fact that at least at Spirit Lake, Iowa, to the satisfaction of Wally Jorgensen and his associates doing the work out there, that they can raise sufficient numbers at, at a sufficiently low cost and with reliability and, sur and survival and to the size required by Iowa of purebred muscalunge utilizing artificial diet. And Wally showed results of uh, several years' work with that and uh, other than a, a mortality that was not related to the diet, uh, they were successful, they were consistent, and while they were, they were aiming at a slightly smaller fish than some of us work with, uh, uh, it was demonstrated that at least in Iowa and in some other places, that perhaps we are on the threshold of being able to produce that muscalunge on artificial diet. Even though extensive culture seems to be the state of the art with uh, purebred muscalunge. That's not the case with the uh, hybrid or tiger muscalunge. Tom Bender from Pennsylvania gave a, a uh, complete synthesis of this current state of the art with tiger muscalunge. Uh, and at this point with tiger muscalunge and intensive culture units, uh, we are at the point where there's no major breakthrough needed. What we're doing now is indicated in Tom's paper is a refinement of techniques. People looking at the little things, what can we do better? We're doing it well now, but can we do it better? It's, it's a matter of just refining things and making it better. In light of need for refinement, Jim Mead, a research biologist from the Fish and Wildlife Service at Wellsboro, addressed some of those things. He looked at very uh, small unit research controlled experiments on the effects of temperature, feeding rate, diet composition, and loading levels on the production of tiger muscalunge, of hybrid muscalunge. And as a result of that has provided some guidelines for optimum production under those kinds of conditions in an intensive culture situation on artificial diet. The last paper was presented by James Harvey, Jim Harvey of Pennsylvania. And Jim looked at something that perhaps uh, is more important than uh, the anglers realize uh, and that is the quality of the product that leaves the hatchery, the health of the animal. Working from a case history of, of uh, diagnostic uh, pathology that was carried out under uh, standardized and rigorous procedures so that he knew what he was looking at, Jim identified some of the problems that we run into with hatchery produced fish under intensive culture, particularly on artificial diet. Bacterial, systemic bacterial infections are very important uh, in causing problems in hatcheries. Bacterial gill diseases, of uh, several kinds of very, very important factors. The thrust of the paper was that we can identify these things and we can be looking for them, but prevention is better than treatment. That hatchery management to avoid the circumstances that cause these diseases is extremely important and early detection is extremely important because numbers of fish out of a hatchery are meaningless if the animal is not healthy. If it's, not, if it's already stressed when it's stocked, it's going into a very difficult world out there. One of the things that I particularly liked and uh, felt very good about in sharing that session was that very frequently a criticism lodged at people that are involved in propagation of fish is that the end product to them is the number of they produced, the cost effectiveness of that production, and what leaves the hatchery. And once the truck rolls through the gate, they could really care less. Three of the four presenters 
either in closing or very near the end of their presentation, showed a slide taken on their own states of what they consider the reason they're in the hatchery, the end product. And I think some of you saw that, a picture of a very happy angler with a very nice muskie. Thanks to the uh, members of the session. The fifth session, which was, which took place this morning, I'm going to, in the interest of time, uh, skip over a general summary. Not that that session is not deserving of a summary, but uh, I think there was uh, some excellent information presented and in very fine fashion, and, and uh, I'm thinking it will stand on its own merit. <clears throat> we also had uh, an excellent poster session and that was headed up by Kevin Richards uh, in the interest of time. Uh, I, I think that uh, we will uh, pass on a summary of that too, uh, not to slight it, but uh, we do want to recognize the excellent quality of that poster session as well. I said I was going to forego the summary on the fifth session, the role of the angler. I would like to make just about three or four uh, statements uh, relative to that and uh, on, on the subject of uh, <clears throat> catch and release I, I wonder if it isn't time that uh, uh, we begin to emphasize the, the positive not that we aren't emphasizing the positive but <clears throat> we all recognize that uh, inherent in the practice of catch and release uh, some mortality can occur some mortality does occur. There are variables at work. Uh, the physical uh, conditions uh, of each situ situation, uh, water temperatures, uh, the expertise of the angler, which uh, come into play. Nevertheless, I think we've heard that uh, quality information is at hand, which quite uniformly indicates that survival of these released fish is high and rather than opening our discussions or uh, our phrases uh, from the negative aspect, uh, describing or enumerating mortality, that uh, perhaps we should make a special effort uh, to emphasize or discuss in terms of the, the positive approach, uh, there's the survival, uh, which from all we've heard is certainly the, the larger, much larger of the two figures. We also heard that uh, there have been significant contributions from the angler group. Uh, I think uh, quite emphatically beyond uh, the, the, the uh, direct and obvious uh, benefits, uh, such as the, the rearing and stocking. We've heard of the uh, data collection uh, and contribution of that data. Uh, research support and funding, and uh, I guess most dramatically the, the symposium itself. Uh, any good piece of work will uh, generate as many questions as it answers, and I hope that's the case uh, regarding the symposium. Uh, the research panel has uh, defined some, some areas of concerns, and we for certain have not answered all the questions, but we have identified uh, some areas and uh, hopefully this will, will provide uh, some direction uh, the, the course that, uh, courses that we pursue. Uh, there are quite a few people that I would like to recognize. Uh, our intent early on in the organization of this symposium was to gather people which would give a good geographic representation across the Muskie Range and uh, would also provide a good balance uh, between the various agencies and institutions which play a part in the, the species which is of concern and interest to all of us. We've had three people serving uh, in an advisory capacity 
to us. Uh, first being uh, Dr. Uh, Ed Crossman. Ed is curator in charge, uh, Department of Ichthyology and Herpetology, the Royal Ontario Museum. He is also professor in the Department of Zoology, University of Toronto. Ed served double duty for us, uh, serving as uh, chairman of the session on interactions. Bob, if you could give me a hand, uh, we have a little token of our appreciation for these people, and if Ed could 